This month we have Nintendo Power number 70 for March of 1995, and we have a sports game this issue that actually is something to talk about. Two, actually, sort of. One of them's a sort of. The cover game this issue is NBA Jam Tournament Edition, and the cover appears to be showing a horn in a bowl going after a jump ball, and it looks... disturbing. In the letters column for this issue, we have more responses to the Donkey Kong Country video. The power charts have been moved to the front of the issue this time. Mega Man X2 has entered the Super Nintendo list, and Super Mario Kart, Super Street Fighter 2, and Secret of Mana have returned, while Star Fox 2 has left. The themed list is for epics this time, meaning RPGs. And on the Game Boy list, we actually have some new entrants, including the Game Boy version of NBA Jam and Space Invader, while on the Hall of Fame front, the NES versions of Metroid, Dr. Wario, and, or Mario, rather, and Dragon Warrior have entered the Hall of Fame. First up, we have NBA Jam Tournament Edition, and... NBA Jam has had some big shifts with this game. More players on more teams, along with some hidden players of the being done in the Mortal Kombat variety. We have rundowns of the team stats for most of the teams, along with notes on some of the hidden players. NBA Jam Term Edition is a game that plays blazingly fast, so much so that I feel the computer plays faster than I can react. That said, the game has a whole bunch of really neat options to change up gameplay, like power-ups and hotspots marked on the court, but the game is still perfectly playable without those if you want the basketball equivalent of Final Destination no items. Still, this feels like the perfect game for couch competitive play, for playing with your roommate or a bunch of friends, then something to play seriously against the computer. This, like Super Bomberman, is the perfect dorm room or work break room game. We've had Winter CES now, and there's a whole bunch of uh, run down new stuff from the show, including a tease over Super Mario RPG, along with boasts over all of the RPGs that the N64 will get that the PS1 won't. And, um, no, I'm sorry. No, that, that, that doesn't happen. We, we get RPGs. Well, the N64 gets RPGs. They just don't all come to the United States, and there aren't a lot, and there aren't a lot of them. In fact, there are less of them than there are for the PS1. Our next game is Metal Warriors, a collaboration between Konami and LucasArts with an anime-themed mecha game. The guide talks about in-mech and out-of-mech action, so you're getting in and out of your vehicle like with, um, well, Blaster Master, though without out-of-robot dungeon sections. And also information on the fact that your robot can be stolen if left unattended in the wrong spot. We get maps and notes in the first six stages. Metal Warriors is interesting. It feels like a 2D side-scrolling Desert Strike, except with mechs, with the very important difference that Desert Strike has few spots on the map where health and ammo pickups just respawn. So if you can get out of a combat situation, you can head to that spot and reload. Metal Warriors didn't have that, so the game ends up having the frustrating version of trial and error gameplay, where the, the kind where you can screw yourself in the middle of a level for reasons that you don't understand, or that you only understand far too late to make any correction, and you have no real choice but to hit the reset button, reset button, and start the whole game over. It's frustrating, and something that doesn't really value the player's time. With emulation, at least, you can do a start of mission save, so you can, in theory, start the level over from scratch rather than just the whole game. We have a new column this issue with coverage of various RPGs in the Epic Center. I'll be giving this a bit more attention than the sports, columns, as there's generally a lot more to talk about with JRPGs than there are sports games. This issue has a basic tease on Ogre Battle, followed by feature coverage of King Arthur and the Knights of Justice, based on the cartoon show, and published by Koei. King Arthur and the Knights of Justice is designed as a more user-friendly Falcom-style game with an adventuring party. The game itself controls well enough, with the Falcom-style more hardcore mechanic being a power meter for your attacks, preventing you from just being able to spam your big hits more or less endlessly, sort of like in Secret Mana, both with a few other bits there as well. It's just that the game puts its worst foot forward with a semi-pixel bitch fetch quest, combined with your AI companions being of dubious utility, and which is not helped by the fact that the game, unlike Secret of Mana, lacks multiplayer support. Now, I do appreciate the amount of work being put into a video game that is based on a flash-in-the-pan Saturday morning cartoon, but it's still underwhelming considering other games that are of this genre. 
that were out at this point, and which are still reasonably available, affordable, and not too hard to get in some form or another. Here, however, is the game we've really been waiting for, Earthbound. An introduction to your party members and a variety of game mechanics. Earthbound is an RPG with, deliberately, not too much mechanical complexity, but plenty of charm and narrative breadth. It's a game that's as approachable as some of the early Dragon Quest games, and instead of just using the general charm of Akira Toriyama's character designs to get over some of the more simplistic elements of the story, it has a similarly involved story, which feels weirdly complex but not mature from the get-go, and adds depth as the story goes on. By the way, saying the story doesn't seem mature from the no onset isn't a knock against it. It's got a very level of specifically tailored immaturity that fits in my head with the kind of adventures that a kid would dream of with, when outside playing with other friends. It's not bound to a level of narrative logic and complexity that we as adults hold our fiction to. Things happen because they happen. And because under the circumstances it seems narratively appropriate for that thing to happen, even if it would be actually impossible for that thing to happen. And I mean that also in the sense of introducing concepts which are, at this point, mostly out of the blue. It feels like the same process that was used to make the Japanese horror film House. But with instead of being used to write a ghost story, it's used to make a kid's adventure movie like E.T. or The Goonies. Considering that writer Shigesato Itoi had as one of his goals to evoke a sense of nostalgia, and considering at this point in the 90s, those type of adventure stories were on the wane in film and television, I can definitely see going with that particular kind of narrative, because just by making that choice, you evoke a sense of nostalgia, both for a child's fantasy and for a particular flavor of child's fantasy that is told less often. Continuing with the RPG coverage, we get some info on the relics and how to get them in Final Fantasy III, and a starting character and item guide for Might and Magic. If you've been reading my blog at CountZeroOR.com, then you've seen the ignition factor come up in my recaps of Next Gen Magazine. If you haven't, then this is a shooter where you play as a firefighter instead of shooting bullets or ray guns or whatever you're spraying down water on fire. The Ignition Factor is, in a lot of respects, a run-based arcade-style game, where the ultimate goal of each level is to find the most efficient path through the level to allow you to find enough survivors and get out. It's one of those games, kind of like um, TNC, um, TNC Surf Design Thriller Safari, where I am legitimately shocked that there isn't a speedrun community behind this game. Checking speedruns.com, there are only three runs listed for this game at this time as when I'm recording it. That said, the game doesn't have any real mechanics to extend your time in each building to allow you to continue the, sh the search, which is less conductive for home play and feels more appropriate for an arcade game. However, I'm not seeing any information on an arcade version of this game, Additionally, not being able to shoot in the diagonals is somewhat frustrating, as is not being able to see fire out of the catwalks when you're on a lower level. Otherwise, I think the game is fun, though in need of a little more refinement. Next up is Speedy Gonzalez, Los Gatos Banditos, a platformer from Sunsoft featuring a certain very fast cartoon rodent, presumably made in another attempt to follow in the footsteps of a, of a similar critter on a rival console. The article has a map of the first stage and notes on subsequent stages. Well, if you're looking for a Super Nintendo Sonic game, I think Speedy Gonzalez pulls it off. The game has a very solid sense of speed, incredibly strong patrol controls, and level designs that encourage exploration in a way that the Sonic games don't quite do. And because each level has a clearly delineated time limit, and the game seeds extension power-up items in each level, time extension power-ups, the game manages to balance the idea of gotta go pa fast, albeit with uh, Speedy's Spanish version of that, with levels that you can and should explore. Also, checking on eBay, as of this recording, the game is shockingly affordable, so there's also that going for it as well. There's a new installment of Top Gear 3000, and now we're in space. Not sure why they made that decision, but here we are. 
Dr. Close notes on some of the new gameplay mechanics. Sadly, I was not able to get Top Gear 3000 to work in emulation, so I'm going to have to skip this game. In classified information, we have a code to play as Amakusa in the countdown and versus modes of Samurai Showdown. Well, well before The Lost World, we got a video game sequel to Jurassic Park with Jurassic Park Part 2. This time it's done as a more conventional run-and-gun shooter. There's a rundown of the weapons and notes on six of the missions. Jurassic Park Part 2 is a rough game. It's level-based, has decent run-and-gun content, and fairly large levels. But it also has a single life before a game over, and if you get a game over, you're starting over the whole game. Yes, there are unlimited continues, but it doesn't help the sensation of finished feeling like you're beating your head against the wall while you're playing a particular game. Considering the length of the title and the length of some of the levels, this is a considerable strike against the game, and one which makes something I can't recommend. Next up is Hagane, which is probably the rarest title covered this issue, and is a ninja-themed action game from Hudson. The article's maps the first three stages, and notes on stages four and five. Hagane is a very beautiful game, but also one that is punchingly difficult. I saw the game for the first time, time during a Games Done Quick event, and was incredibly impressed by the game's visual style and level of detail, and eagerly looked forward to being able to play it for the show. Once I was able to get my hands on with the game, I was also impressed by the game's difficulty, both for good and ill. This was hard enough that I got a game over on the first level, which doesn't happen to me often. There's a couple reasons for this. The, uh, probably the most self-evident one is checkpointing. I didn't encounter any mid-level checkpoints in the first level of the game, which is a problem from a pacing and general quality of life standpoint. Also from a pacing standpoint, this makes levels feel more monotonous, as you have to retread the same area over and over again, which makes it feel like you're, well, having a Sis taking part in a Sisyphean labor. Um, when you're seeing the same scenery over and over again, it feels frustrating, it gives a sense you're not making any progress. Second, from a quality of life standpoint, this level of difficulty and lack of checkpointing artificially extends how long it takes to beat the level of the game, meaning it takes more time for you to beat it, and if your game doesn't have a password or save system, then that means you have to start from scratch each time, which is crappy. Yes, lots of NES games did that, but also lots of NES games had some form of password system, especially as games got longer. Games and levels definitely are getting longer here in the, NES, in the Super Nintendo era. I still think the game's worth playing, but this is a game I prefer to play through emulation than through a physical cartridge on original hardware. Before there was Space Jam, we got Looney Tunes B-Ball, a NBA Jam-style basketball game with Looney Tunes characters. This game is kind of a mess, mainly due to AI balance or the lack thereof. The controls aren't terrible, it's just that the balance for the opponents isn't there. Over the course of playing a game, I found myself getting raffle stomped by Wiley e. Coyote and Yosemite Sam while playing as Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck. Without any real feedback of what I needed to do to improve my play, either in terms of being better at defense, or what I needed to do to be better at defense, or how to get better at offense. Moving on, we have an article with an inside look at what it's like at the Game Counselor's hotline, including information on how better to manage the phone menu. Or navigate, rather. Speaking of which, next is Counselor's Corner. They have a guide for level 814 on the Game Boy version of Donkey Kong. Moving on, we have a superhero game with The Incredible Hulk, which I believe is the first Hulk game we've seen thus far. The article has notes on all five stages. Incredible Hulk is a game that sort of works in concept, but utterly fails in execution. The concept, going from how they executed it, or tried to, is to do this as a sort of Kung Fu Spartan X clone with some platforming, with you playing as the Hulk and facing off against various soldiers instead of Kung Fu goons as you make your way through levels. The game plays with the Hulk banner dichotomy by providing capsules in which you can pick up in levels, but lets you switch back to banner until you take damage, allowing you to access some alternate routes. The problem is that the controls are just a little too clunky to handle the boss fights, which is where the game really falls apart, as they're punchy mash fests where your opponent is able to still act and deal damage during their invulnerability frames, and you aren't. Continuing on, we have Artie Lightfoot from European developer Titus, with notes on general mechanics. Artie Lightfoot is, as platformers go, a diamond in the rough. 
It's a game with pretty good controls, plenty of style, flair, and even an interesting narrative and world design, but some issues with how the controls shake out. This is particularly the case when it comes to your verb set. Artie has two attack verbs, a regular attack that, can, that he can do with full health, and then a double jump that does damage if well targeted, except it's somewhat hard to target, and is only actually useful in particular environments or against particular enemies. It's kind of frustrating to carry out in practice. On the other hand, the game with Unlimited continues in a pretty basic, though possibly not colorblind friendly, password system, and as mentioned earlier, rock solid controls, which makes for a game that is definitely something that, while flawed, is still a fun experience. Finally, we're wrapping up the game review of this issue with Bubsy 2, now with weapons, which makes it more of a shooter ish thing. There are notes in the first five stages and some mini games. What speaks volume of Bubsy's 2 is that there are ways in the early levels of this game to get stuck in areas that you can't get out of, but also can't take damage in, so you're forced to either wait oh, the 10 plus minutes for the timer to run out and your character to die, or to hit the restart button on the con console and start the entire game over. That is just poorly thought out level design and speaks volumes about the Bubsy franchise as a whole. However, the other major fe feature of this issue, aside from the feature article on NBA Jam, is the 1994 Nintendo Power Awards, which are only being handed out for two systems, the Super Nintendo and the Game Boy, and they're no longer being called the Nesters. My picks for all the categories, aside from uh, Best Sports, which I don't care about, are for graphics and sound, Super Punch-Out on, on the Super Nintendo, and Wario Land on the Game Boy. For challenge and play control, Super Metroid on the Super NES, and Donkey Kong on the Game Boy. For theme and fun, I have Super Metroid on the SNES, and Samurai Showdown on the Game Boy. For best tournament fighter, I have Samurai Showdown on the Super Nintendo. For best multiplayer, I have Super Bomberman 2. For best hero, as Celis is not available, I'm going with Samus Aran. For best villain, I pick Kefka. For best baddie, which is also described as best mid-boss, I'd pick Ultros. For best original character, I pick Zero. For coolest weapon or item, my pick is the Grapple Beam from Super Metroid. Best goody or ally is the Interceptor from Final Fantasy. Best setting or story is Final Fantasy III. Coolest transportation is Setzer's Airship. Best move is the Crystal Flash from Super Metroid, as super suplexing a train from Final Fantasy III is not listed, sadly. And best overall game is Final Fantasy III. On the now playing column, the also rans include Brandish, Breakthrough, Bust a Move, Carrier Aces, Micro Machines, and Pinball Fantasies. Finally, in Pack Watch, we have the Fighting Game, Weapon Lord, Kirby's Dreamland 2, and Star Trek Deep Space Nine. This issue has a bunch of games that are really, really expensive to pick up, and this is not too surprising as we're approaching the end of the Super Nintendo's lifespan but it makes it harder to make a recommendation. So, like, most of the top games this issue, Earthbound, RD Lightfoot, Hagane, Metal Warriors, they can't be obtained for less than $100 as of this recording, at least for legit copies of the actual physical game. There are plenty of illegal bootlegs out there for some of them, and some of them are available in digital distribution copies. So, this time I'm doing two picks, the budget pick and the anything kind of ghost pick. The budget pick is NBA Jam Tournament Edition. It's like the ultimate Super Nintendo dorm and roommate game, and it's one where, well, it's really affordable to get a hold of. Like, it's one of those things that you find in bargain bins at conventions and indie game stores and that sort of thing. So if you're, you have somebody to play with, you're, or a bunch of people to play with, if you're in a dorm environment, you're going to have a good time, and were not very expensive either. Um, on the other hand, for the Anything Goes pick, I'm going with Earthbound. It's a game with a tremendous amount of charm and heart, and it makes a really good time. It's, the gameplay is fun. It's fairly simple. Um, additionally, if you have access, if you're able to get a hold of a Super Nintendo Mini, Mini, you can get it that way. If you have Super Nintendo Virtual Console on the platform that you use, if you still have a Wii U, or if you still have your new 3DS. Um, it's available that way as well. So again, those two avenues, it, it is more approachable, it is more accessible 
for legit ways to play it of the other super expensive titles. Though if you want to get an actual cartridge of it, then you're going to have to shove, stick out the big bucks. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.